They are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with the United Nations Foundation's Energy Access Practitioner Network. Today's webinar will discuss mini grids, tools, and resources that can be useful for practitioners during the planning, design, and operation of mini grid projects. And one important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solution Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solution Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And also, just before we begin, um, just want to go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing that will just help eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. And if you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option, and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin that you should use to dial in. If anyone's having technical technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826 and they can help you there. And if you'd like to ask a question during the webinar and we encourage everyone to do, uh, do so, we ask that you use the questions pane where you can type in your question um, and we will receive those through there. If you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, we will be posting PDF copies of the presentations to cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you may follow along, or uh, in also an audio recording of the presentations will be posted to the Solution Center training page within a few days of today's broadcast. Uh, just a reminder, we're also now adding Solution Center uh, webinar recordings to the YouTube channel where you'll find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. So today's webinar agenda is uh, centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Tripta Singh, Basil Kandav, Peter Lilienthal, and Pierre Tellep. These expert panelists have been kind enough to join us to showcase a catalog of tools relevant for mini-grid practitioners and panelists, and participants will discuss selected tools and their uses in details. Before our speakers begin their presentations, I'll provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solution Center initiative, and then following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience. <clears throat> So this slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center came to be formed. The Solution Center is one of 13 initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial that was launched in April of 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. Some outcomes of this unique initiative include support of developing countries and emerging economies through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools, such as the webinar you are now attending. And there's four primary goals for the Solution Center. First is to serve as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. Second is to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. Third, uh, they strive to deliver dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And then lastly, the center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation from around the globe. And the primary audience for the Solution Center is typically energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries, but we do also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society as well. So this slide shows one of the marquee features that the Solution Center provides, which is the no-cost expert policy assistance known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert program has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are each available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. So for example, in the area of rural electrification, we're very pleased to have Ibrahim Raymond, Director of the Social Transformation Division at the Energy and Resources Institute, serving as one of our experts. So if you have a need for policy assistance in rural electrification or any other clean energy sector, 
uh, we do encourage you to use this valuable service. And again, it's provided to you free of charge. So if you have a question for our experts, please feel free to just submit it through our online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. Or to find out how the Ask an Expert service can benefit your work, please contact uh, me directly at sean.esterly at nrel.gov or give me a call at 303-384-7436. And we do also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. So now I'd like to provide brief introductions for today's panelists. Uh, our first, first speaker we'll be hearing from is Tripta Singh. Tripta is the Director for Energy Access at the UN Foundation. She leads the Energy Access Practitioners, Practitioner Network's activities on mini-grids and manages its engagement in Asia. Prior to joining the foundation, she worked at World Neighbors, where she helped manage community health and environment programs in several developing countries. And then following Tripta, we will hear from Basel Kondev, an energy advisor at GIZ in Germany. His responsibilities include strategic and technical advisory to a portfolio of GIZ projects on rural electrification in both Africa and Asia. He is also involved in the li uh, liaison with partners and international initiatives. <clears throat> Our third speaker today uh, will be Dr. Peter Lilienthal. Peter is the president and CEO of Homer Energy, and since 1993 has been the developer of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's Homer Hybrid Power Optimization Software, which has been used by over 135,000 energy practitioners in 193 countries. He has been active in the field of renewable energy and energy efficiency since 1978. <clears throat> And our final presenter today is Pierre Tellet, Energy Advisor at GIZ. Pierre has more than 10 years of global experience in the energy sector, including operational leadership of energy organizations. He has worked across the energy supply chain, including development and engineering for generation and distribution businesses. And so with those introductions, I'd now like to turn things over to Tripta. Um, Tripta, are you uh, able to connect and hear us? Hi, can you, uh, can you hear me, Sean? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so in my presentation, I will provide just a very brief overview of uh, the Sustainable Energy for All uh, initiative and the practitioner network, which is part of the broader umbrella of the SE for All initiative, and go over uh, the objectives of the clean energy mini grids high impact opportunity. Um, are you able to turn my slides, Sean, could I go to the next slide, please? Hello? Yes, Tripta, we're on the next slide now. Okay, thank you. So as we all know, there are about 102, uh, 1.2 billion people all over the world who currently don't have access to uh, electricity. And a billion more have only irregular access and about 3 billion people uh, currently lack access to clean cooking solutions. And it's an astounding number of people that currently uh, are without these modern energy services, especially given the fact that uh, we now have the technology to be able to provide uh, these to uh, those uh, who don't uh, currently have access. And in response to that, uh, to, this, uh, to this problem, the UN Secretary General in uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon started the initiative on uh, sustainable energy for all, uh, which has three main objectives. The first one is ensuring universal access to modern energy services. The second is doubling the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency. And the third is doubling the share of renewable energy in uh, the global energy mix. Uh, in 2014, uh, the decade from 2014 to 2024 was declared as a decade of sustainable energy for all. And uh, more recently, earlier this year in September, uh, the, the, during, the, uh, sustainable, uh, during the Sustainable Development Goal Summit, energy was adopted as Sustainable Development Goal number seven. Uh, next slide, please. And the Sustainable uh, Energy for All initiative provided a global framework or, or the background to declare or to uh, adopt energy as, uh, as a Sustainable Development Goal and uh, called on the world to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. And there is, along with this, there is increasing recognition now of the role that energy plays in enabling the other development indicators, such as uh, 
health, education, uh, women's empowerment, improved livelihoods, etc. Uh, next slide, please. And at the UN Foundation, we have um, what is called the Energy Access Practitioner Network that uh, a number of you are probably already familiar with. It currently has about 2,000 members and who've, who have to date collectively provided uh, energy solutions to more than 230 million people around the world. And uh, the, our membership is uh, spread across 170 countries. And the focus of the Energy Access Practitioners Network is mostly on uh, decentralized renewable energy solutions. It focuses on micro, on market-based uh, mini and off-grid solutions. It, uh, a number, uh, in fact, majority of our num uh, members are based in developing countries and providing energy services to uh, populations in remote locations who uh, currently don't have access to them. Next slide, please. And uh, with that background, uh, the International Energy Agency, uh, I think in 2011, uh, projected that over 40% of the additional capacity that is required to provide universal energy access by 2030 will be most economically delivered through mini and microgrids. And in recognition of the important role that uh, mini and microgrids are likely to play in the provision of universal energy access, the Sustainable Energy for All initiative uh, classified or designated mini grids as an area of uh, as a high impact opportunity, which means that a category of action that's likely uh, to produce transformational impact. And so, in June last year, during the Sustainable Energy for All forum, uh, the uh, high impact opportunity on mini grids on clean energy mini grids was launched. It, uh, next slide, please. And so this, uh, uh, this HIO uh, currently has around uh, 150 members and it's, uh, it's constantly growing. And, it has, uh, the, and the HIO basically provides uh, an, a framework uh, and a coordination mechanism that, uh, uh, that can create uh, or that can result in accelerated investment and deployment and replication of, uh, of mini grids to contribute towards the global goal of uh, energy access for all by 2030. And the five objectives of uh, the, this HIO are better integration of clean energy mini grids in national and international energy plans and regulations, uh, improving the coordination uh, and interaction in the mini grid sector, so basically building, um, building uh, better partnerships, catalyzing uh, greater involvement of, uh, of stakeholders in promoting the sector forward. Uh, uh, also creating uh, agreement and knowledge of key concepts, so making sure that uh, a number of uh, terms or standards that are, uh, that, uh, that are needed or used in the mini grid sector, that there is a common understanding of what all those mean. It, will, it also focuses on increasing, uh, uh, on, on facilitating greater deployment of business models. And a way to do that is to um, develop and test business models and then increase, uh, increase the visibility or, of or the ones that are innovative and successful uh, to, uh, to promote greater uh, replication or, uh, or scaling up. Uh, and also um, the last one is uh, improve visibility and recognition of clean energy mini grids as a viable approach. So uh, that, can, uh, that includes uh, educating people or making them, making them aware, including policy makers, investors, etc., of, uh, of, uh, of the possibilities that the sector offers and also uh, improving, their, or in, improving their understanding of uh, the way the sector functions so that, their, for example, their perception of risk that's inherent uh, of the, that they consider to be a part of the sector is, uh, uh, is uh, is uh, is consistent with what is actually uh, what is actually uh, the reality on the ground. So for this uh, for for this uh, next slide, please. So for this webinar, what we have uh, what we would uh, like to uh, do is uh, to present some tools and resources that can be useful for mini grid practitioners, and it's a contribution to uh, to the clean energy mini grids HIO and particularly. Um, 
the objects, the different objectives of this HIO. And uh, I will um, I will end just by uh, kind of pointing out two of the tools that uh, we will be producing uh, in the coming days or coming months, I should say. We are going to uh, we are going to publish uh, an investment directory uh, sometime in December this year, uh, which will showcase investment and financing needs uh, in the sector in the de in the decentralized uh, renewable energy sector overall, but focusing mainly on the financing needs of mini grids projects uh, and companies. The second uh, product that will be coming up soon is a quarterly mini grids newsletter that will carry uh, the activities of the HIO but will also uh, showcase best practices, opportunities and events in the mini grids uh, sector more broadly and we invite contributions from, uh, from members or from uh, all those who are on the webinar today for instance to, uh, that you would like to see featured in that newsletter. I should also mention that earlier this year uh, the HIO produced uh, a tool on uh, uh, that kind of provided uh, all the opportunity, all the financing opportunities and technical assistance um, uh, sources that are available, and it, cre it did a mapping of uh, of these resources that are uh, that are in the sector. And the Alliance for Rural Electrification, that co-hosts the secretary uh, secretariat for the Clean Energy Mini Grids HIO. Uh, took the lead on that, and so that tool is available on uh, on the Mini Grids website as well. And you can find that you can find the website address in my one of the earlier slides uh, in my presentation. And uh, of course, this presentation will be on the Clean Energy Solutions Center website as well, so you can access it there. And uh, next slide, please, Sean. And if you have any uh, comments or suggestions, or if you would like more information, you're welcome to write to me directly at tsing at unfoundation.org. And with that, um, thank you very much. And uh, I would uh, hand it over to the other panelists. Great. Thank you, Tripta. Um, and we'll move right along now uh, to the next presenter, uh, Basil. And Basel, you still are on mute, but we can see your slides. Perfect. Great. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, Pujil Konif is my name. I work for GIZ. Before jumping to the catalog, I just wanted to mention a few words uh, on GIZ, just in case um, some of you have not come across the name. Uh, we're part of the German Development Corporation and uh, assist the German government in implementing its uh, development uh, policy. Uh, we are publicly funded, non-profit enterprise headquartered in Germany with activities in a number of countries. Um, we also work on behalf of a number of other governments, uh, supporting mainly public sector, but also private sector and uh, civil society. Um, our activities on mini-grids currently span 20 countries. Uh, and we focus on the entire value chain of uh, mini-grid from the promotion um, through policy and strategies, uh, through the development of national programs uh, and incentives for the promotion of mini-grids. We assist private sector in taking on a, a, an active role in developing and implementing uh, and operating mini-grids. We work with strengthening institutions, uh, be it public sector or private sector, through secondment of experts. Uh, we organize uh, exchanges within the sector on different topics. We manage knowledge and uh, as part of our uh, work at global level, we also work with international actors and in that uh, framework we are part of the, the mini-grid HIO that Tripta just uh, mentioned. Um, jumping to the catalog of tools, uh, in many of the meetings that have we've being part of uh, over the last few years, there was always uh, an interest to map out where are and what kind of tools 
uh, are available for mini grid development and implementation. Um, so we decided to venture on that, and we've been collecting input from individual organizations, and we have drafted something that we uh, would like to share with you, and also get your input as to other tools that you are using. Uh, find useful so that we can just map everything and have a comprehensive list. Uh, we do that in order to avoid duplication while developing new tools. Uh, we, uh, in our teams, we usually exchange quite often and uh, sometimes uh, we get questions from uh, some of the countries, hey, do we have a, an Excel sheet for certain calculations? And in the headquarters, we do have uh, access to some of the uh, the tools and we share those that have been used. Uh, we don't endorse the ones that we've listed just because there's so many. Uh, we haven't really tried uh, all of them, but those are tools that we've heard some some practitioners have used um, and some that we have used uh, ourselves. Um, by doing that exercise, we also try to map where there are existing gaps, where there are no tools at the moment. And uh, I think it would be always uh, good to have to continue the discussion on uh, on those tools and see how some organizations jointly can develop tools that are currently missing. Um, so uh, until now, we've managed to group the tools that we've identified in six categories. You'll see them in a second. Um, some 40 plus tools have been identified. Those include software packages, checklists, templates, uh, cloud-based solutions that are tied to, to certain products. And uh, we're currently the latest uh, in phase of collecting input for, for the catalog, and we hope to release it in the first quarter of next year as part of the outputs of the Clean Energy Mini Grid uh, HIO that Tripta presented and we are part of. Um, so what are the tools? Um, I won't go through all of them. Some probably you've seen, some are uh, things that you probably use on a daily basis, uh, but we've grouped some of the categories that are that we might group them in. Uh, there are tools for planning and mapping that we've identified. Um, I won't read all of them, just look at the logos. The, all these hyp are hyperlinks, so you can just click them after you uh, download the presentation from, from the website. Uh, we found some tools for resource assessments uh, that are available through different providers. Um, and there are a myriad of tools on technical system design and analysis. Uh, some will be presented in, in a few seconds by, by Peter and Pierre. Um, there are tools also that we've found and have used on financial planning, business model development. We've also done some small contributions ourselves in, in uh, filling in some of the gaps that, that exist. Um, uh, uh, some of the tools are in development. We're in touch with, with Irena on their project navigator. They're adding uh, an element on off-grid. So those are quite useful ones. Um, there are also tools that we know and have partially co-developed in some cases on around operations and management. The productive use uh, tool is one thing that uh, some of our teams have been working on over the years, and you see some, some of the other providers are on payment platforms, cloud-based solutions for um, customer uh, management or uh, management of, of suppliers on, on this slide. Uh, and there are also a number of tools covering various topics that are uh, directly or indirectly related to minigrids, we decided to map these out as well so that uh, people have access to those and just in case uh, they want to present their work in a slightly different, uh, for, to a slightly different target group, they can also do that or expand their activities into areas that are not directly linked to, to minigrids. Uh, so that's just a brief overview. As I said, we're still collecting inputs uh, and they're two ways that you can easily um, contribute to the development of, of this tool. There is a survey that we are um, just putting online um, that you can fill out. It will take you probably less than five minutes. Uh, you can review the, the catalog. It's available as a doc file on the, the link that's on this slide, and you can just send us your feedback via email. With that, I'll, I'll close the presentation, and thank you for your attention. Hi, thank you, Basil. Um, so now we'll move right along to Peter Lilienthal for his presentation.
Great, and Peter, we can see uh, we can see your slides, but you're still muted. Great, so we can see your slides. Okay, sorry, you're right. I was still, I was still muted. Are you seeing it in slideshow mode or or in the um, in PowerPoint? We're seeing it in PowerPoint. We we had slideshow mode for a second there. In the okay, lower we, right, we if, you click the, um, if you click the slideshow, it should should go to it. So, Peter, if you go to the lower right there of your screen, um, next to where you can adjust the size, there's the slideshow option. Peter, are you still there? Oh, and I think Peter might be having some technical difficulties. Let's give him just a second here, see if he can come back on. If not, um, we, we might move right along to Pierre's presentation, um, but let's see if he comes back on. We'll just give him a moment. Hi, Peter. Yeah, so I lost the audio connection. Um, can but you can still see my screen? Um, I, I believe we're still seeing your screen. It's still in PowerPoint mode. Um, do you need us to run your slides for you? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. Um, but well, you might as well, I guess. All right. Um. So, so let's go to the next slide. Um, um, yep. Give us one second, Peter. We got to get get your slides up. I apologize for the um, glitch here. Just as I was about to start, my I lost an audio the audio connection, according to this. So, um, Peter, Tim will be running your slides. So just let them know next slide when you're ready to advance. Um, okay. Um, um, okay, well, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Um, and, and I can't see the slides myself, so uh, this should say the future of power, and it's a very short slide just describing setting up the transition we're doing from highly polluting centralized power to um, you, that use fossil fuels to distributed renewable power, uh, and our Homer software is the key to that transition. So next slide shows the guy with scratching his head. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of challenges facing this transition. Mini grids are small, but ironically, they're also more complex than simply connecting to the utility grid. Because solar and wind don't stand on their own, they must be part of a hybrid system. And out of all these new technologies, both new and old, which combination makes the most sense? Uh, so next slide, please. The, the answer, unfortunately, is that it depends. There is no one-size-fits-all cookie-cutter solution like a Model T. To answer that question, we need to know what are the resources available on site, what is the load profile, what are the reliability requirements, what are the load management opportunities, what will the cost of fuel be in five years, what do we want to assume about the cost and performance of batteries and other technologies that keep getting better? That's a good thing, but confusing, and a, and a confused mind says no. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so the Homer software fits all those pieces together. It's the only decision tool for distributed generation and microgrids that models combinations of renewables with conventional generation storage and load management. It's fully chronological simulation layer dispatches generation and manages storage to meet the load in every hour. 
It does that for an entire year to calculate fuel consumption, run times, maintenance requirements, and operating costs. It then optimizes the design by simulating hundreds or thousands of different design configurations and ranking them by net present cost, total cost of ownership, or other criteria. Finally, this is all packaged within a decision analytic framework to identify sensitivities and robust solutions. The utility planning tools that do this are 100 times more expensive, difficult to use, and inappropriate for smaller distributed power projects. Um, next slide, please. Actually, this is where I was going to show a screenshot of our new Homer Pro. Uh, unfortunately, I can't do that. But uh, for those of you familiar with the older Homer, the functionality has been expanded, still somewhat similar, but the user interface is completely different. So I um, suggest uh, trying our 30-day free trial to get familiar with the new version. Um, this slide is animated, so I'm not sure how well this is going to work with I can't control that. But um, one of the uses that our users tell us ha is the highest value of, uh, or a high value for Homer is as a communication tool. So um, uh, yeah, Sean, if you can just, uh, I would just click through the whole, I can't see what you're doing, but click show the whole s slide, it, that would be the best thing to do here. Um, we work with renewable advocates who want to go to 100% renewable right away, and diesel mechanics who want to keep doing what they've always done. And these two groups don't communicate well with each other. We also deal with power engineers who have their own specialized software for power flow and transient stability, but don't consider economics. And we deal with the financial community that have sophisticated spreadsheets, but don't consider any of the technical details. Power projects don't get developed unless you can bridge the gap between these worlds, and that's what the Homer software does. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit of history. It, it grew out of the, uh, was one of the outcomes of the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio. U.S. Uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, created the Village Power Program. And as part of that program, I recognized the need for an optimization tool to design renewable power solutions where the only previous options were diesel generators and grid extension. This problem is too complex for spreadsheets, so Homer originally required specialized Unix-based optimization software. But in 1998, we converted it to Windows and put it on the web for others to download and use. Then in 2001, we upgraded it to model grid-connected systems and larger islanded systems of 100 megawatts or more with multiple generators. It became popular around the world with users needing support and training beyond what is appropriate for a national lab. So in 2009, we licensed it from the lab, and in 2014, created an entirely new version, Homer Pro. Um, and we've been releasing substantial upgrades every quarter and are now up to 135,000 users in 193 countries. So next slide, please. Homer's become a global standard. Just three weeks ago, we held our third annual Homer Microgrid Conference, this time in Australia. Previous ones were in Cancun and Barcelona. We get speakers and attendees flying in from around the world to attend. We get 65,000 people get our monthly newsletter. RFP is issued by funding agencies like the World Bank and utilities like Horizon Power in Western Australia require that proposals to them include Homer analyses. This quote is from a utility company in Alaska that created the first hybrid power system that can operate for weeks at a time entirely on wind power using load management for stability instead of fossil generation or storage. <clears throat> so let me talk about the market that we serve. It's a highly segmented market. Uh, one of our uh, most important functions is to identify the promising segments. Uh, I know this is uh, really about the um, off-grid segment, but just a short word about the grid-connected segment because it's, it's new and potentially huge, and, it's, and the interest has really increased in Superstorm Sandy in the Northeast U.S. highlighted the need for a more resilient electric system. And microgrids are the best solution for providing critical services during outages due to extreme weather, terrorism, or, <clears throat> or simple failures of our aging infrastructure. And in developing countries with inadequate infrastructure to begin with, um, <clears throat> so microgrids are an opportunity for them to sort of jump, leapfrog, um, uh, to a 21st century uh, power system. Microgrids are also the best way to manage the variability of integrating high penetrations of solar and wind onto an electric 
grid. Uh, and will we see that with microgrids around the world that currently, off-grid microgrids, that are currently at very high penetration, re renewable penetration levels, much higher than what we see in the grid-connected world. And without this capability that microgrids have of m managing that variability, we, we're already seeing utility companies such as in Hawaii uh, um, and Arizona here in the U.S. Uh, pushing back against further renewable development. But on the off-grid and island microgrids is really the focus today. And as um, Tripp had pointed out, there's 1.3 billion people with no access to modern power. There are even more who have only part-time power, um, either because they're uh, using a diesel generator that's only scheduled to run for a few hours in the evening, or because the utility service is just very unreliable. Um, so Homer has been instrumental in showing how to cost effectively serve these huge markets, reducing fuel costs by 50% or more. These off-grid and island microgrids, where we've been working for the last 20 years, are already demonstrating how to have stable, high-quality power relying primarily on renewables. This experience and expertise developed by this community is now becoming valuable to the much larger grid-connected world. So I uh, hope you've caught, kept up with me on the slides. This slide is a map showing where home has been used. And um, we've been told that most of the microgrids under development globally have used Homer. And in just the last few months, we've started collecting the locations of where people are using Homer. We have over 8,000 distributed generation projects in our database and adding about 1,000 per month. This, our, the, our proprietary database has detailed data on the size of projects, their reliability requirements, their cost expectations, and the reliability of the local utility service. We can tell far, how far along they are developing the project, are they ready for financing, who the project developer is, what other services do they need, and what equipment do they expect to use. This database of ours is the fat end of the sales funnel for every supplier in the industry. <clears throat> This is one of my favorite graphs. It's actually from the previous version of Homer, but um, it shows how Homer does a sensitivity analysis. And each of those little diamonds is where we perform an optimization. This is for a relatively small system. Um, and along the bottom, you can see we looked at uh, five different wind speeds from low to high, and likewise, the fuel prices from 20 cents a liter to a dollar a liter. And in the lower left, where fuel prices are low and wind speeds are poor, diesel actually is the lowest cost option. Um, but in, it, it clearly shows that what diesel price PV becomes the cost effective, at what wind speed wind becomes cost effective, which depends upon the fuel price, and where in green a combination of PV and wind is preferable to either one alone. Uh, now this is for a small system in, in the Philippines. The weather, you know, the resources and the loads, et cetera, and prices, everything, all the factors can change what this could look like. But um, I like to show this to show the, how Homer does sensitivity analysis. So next slide is another analysis uh, that we did just looking at what happens as you add more wind. Um, Molokai is about a five megawatt um, power system. And um, we, without going into it here, we differentiate between low, medium, and high penetration systems. And it, it can show how this wind, in this case with a very good wind resource, excellent wind resource, can bring down the, the cost of power substantially. Uh, but how there's a, always a turning point or a knee, and the trick is to find that minimum. Um, and things like the cost of storage, the opportunities for load management will really affect the shape of that curve. Another graph that we produced from Homer results um, this is for a smaller solar system uh, where um, we looked at the cost of reducing CO2 emissions. So in the, on the far right is the least cost system, which already actually has a substantial amount of solar. But, we, but by going beyond the least cost system, you can reduce the uh, carbon emissions even more at relatively modest cost, again, until you start to reach a kind of knee where costs start increasing dramatically. What this graph shows me is that the endpoints aren't the right solution. People act like you either do it 100% renewable or don't do anything at all, where the, uh, um, what, what Homer is showing is that you can accomplish quite a lot at, ver at, at a very modest cost. 
So the next slide is, um, this is two days in July for just one analysis that we did. And the black line shows when the diesel generator had to come on for backup power. You can see the, uh, hopefully the yellow lines are a little faint, but the first day is pretty cloudy, the second day is pretty sunny, and it affects how the battery is getting charged, et cetera. So you can actually see operational details of how a system operates. And because every day is different, um, it really matters to model a whole year chronologically. <clears throat> Finally, just to give you a, a hint of where we're headed uh, if, over the next year, in 2016, uh, we're going to continue our quarterly release schedule. We've got several Fortune 100 companies that are paying us to modify Homer for use by their engineering and sales teams. Uh, we're about to release a Spanish version that's been funded by the Inter-American Development Bank and have been contracted with the World Bank for a French version. The Office of Naval Research has funded another version for the Marine Corps. And we're beta testing a much simpler um, software as a service version we call Quick Start. Um, uh, we also do a lot of uh, Homer training, and we've just uh, expanded our training staff uh, and are creating a certification program. Um, uh, so stay tuned for that, because we would like to do a lot more trainings in country, around the world. We, uh, and so we've expanded that it just recently. Finally, my last slide, I'm just leaving up some of our industry partners. Uh, uh, we've created this industry partner program. This is just the first few that have signed up. Uh, but uh, we, we'd love to talk with all of you more. But I'm going to pass the uh, presentation back at this point. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Peter. Great presentation. And uh, just a reminder to all our attendees that we will be posting the slides um, at the Clean Energy Solutions training page. Um, so you can go out there to access that afterwards. So at this point, we're going to our last presenter today, uh, Pierre. Great. And Pierre, we see your slides. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me as well? Yes, we can. Yep. Can you hear me as well? Yeah, Pierre, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to, to Bozil for having presented uh, GIZ already. Uh, so I'm going to skip that part uh, uh, in my presentation. Um, what I'm going to present today is another tool for, for mini-grid. And uh, the tool is called the mini-grid builder, which is a free tool and on the public domain right now. Um, we are not as DIZ uh, software development company, just, uh, just a side note. Um, this tool was a modest contribution uh, just to enable mini-grid uh, development. So in this presentation, I'm basically going to answer to three questions. Why a mini-grid builder? Uh, what does it do? And how does it work? Just to present uh, the tool. Uh, like one of the presenters has said uh, before, it has been recognized that mini-grids are a high-impact opportunity for achieving the sustainable for all initiatives, objectives. Uh, so being on the ground, developing mini-grids, we notice that uh, development of projects have some challenges. Uh, one of the main challenges for mini-grids is that uh, projects are very much site-specific. So the demand is site-specific. Also, the possible outputs are site-specific. Some areas may have lots of sun, uh, so some other may be suitable with a mini hydro project and other places might just be more blessed with uh, more wind. Uh, so one of the challenges is uh, the site specificity of, uh, of mini grids. The other challenge is that uh, mini grids are usually developed in areas where the main grid is uh, not uh, actually reaching. Uh, so this has to deal with uh, project upfront cost. So we recognize that uh, Developing mini-grids sometimes require high amounts of feasibility studies, and such feasibility study can be 
quite costly for project developers who need to travel in remote places. Um, another challenge um, is with the demand assessment. So how can we properly assess the demand uh, of a mini-grid project when we develop it? So the reality is that uh, there is a big difference between the demand and the effective demand. So the demand is basically what the mini-grid can supply in an idealistic world, where the effective demand is the demand which can be converted into money whenever the project uh, starts supplying this demand. So from commercial viability standpoint, it's very important uh, to design systems which meet the effective demand. Uh, another challenge or the fourth uh, reason uh, why we need a mini-grid builder um, is that at some point the developer needs to set a tariff, the tariff at which is going to sell electricity. And we recognize that there are many tools out there for calculating the tariff, but some of them are very complicated and require high level of education to even understand uh, the model. So there is a need to have something which is just simplified. Um, then there is also a need uh, to actually have a framework for data collection. So there is nothing like uh, one model that can work everywhere. Since every project is site specific, it's uh, needed to collect data before starting developing a project. So this tool, the mini grid builder, what does it do? Uh, it provides the framework for data collection for feasibility study. So instead of somebody going on the ground with questionnaires that they have to fill on paper and then coming back converting them uh, into uh, any kind of digital uh, inputs, they just have this framework already. Uh, the builder, the mini grid builder also aims at reducing project upfront cost. So at the end, the output is a pre-feasibility study that the project developer has. It's like a 12-page document uh, which can already inform into the decision-making process for developing the project. Um, another output of uh, the mini-grid is a workable assessment of the effective demand. So when um, collecting data, uh, the tool gives a framework for seeing what is the ability to pay, what is the willingness to pay, and all of these data are calculated to assess the effective demand. Uh, then the tool also provides a realistic and applicable electricity tariff, which is uh, based on the high cost of electricity, which we just saw on uh, one slide on the home app presentation. And uh, something which is also very important, sometimes there is a time difference between the moment the feasibility study is being carried and the moment the actual project is implemented. Um, when there are such variations, it is very important to always have the ability to update uh, the whole feasibility study without starting it from scratch. So with the tool, someone has uh, all the data stored in, in, in one place, and then if there is an increase of demand, uh, just updating this data can also automatically update the feasibility study. Uh, what we've seen uh, in Kenya, if we consider the cost of feasibility studies, uh, where we are actually right now promoting mini-grid, is that uh, we can save up to 15% up to on total project cost. Of course, this will reflect at the later stage on the tariff at which electricity can be sold in the rural areas. Um, just a few notes how it works. The tool is available for free. Uh, so it is at this link, www.minigridbuilder.com. Uh, how do you use it? Basically, you just create an account, like uh, uh, it's usually done on the internet. And one can use now the, the tool maybe going on, on the site where projects are being implemented to collect socio-economic and demand, uh, demand data. So these data are both uh, qualitative and quantitative. At the end, the tool is going to provide a pre-feasibility study uh, report. 
um, and this data can be updated at the later stage. So what the tool does not do is not uh, it's not a mapping tool to actually see where is the potential, but uh, it provides uh, the project developer with a uh, load assessment. Just uh, one slide to have an overview of the tool. So we have here both uh, qualitative and quantitative data. At the beginning, the user is going to put in key in uh, load profile data. He's going to validate also some financial assumptions. Uh, for instance, the cost of uh, solar panels are not the same in, in all the countries. Uh, so those assumptions have to be validated. Um, then at the end, there is uh, the report that the, the tool uh, provides. Right now, it's uh, just covering East Africa, five countries in East, East Africa. Uh, we are trying to see if uh, there is going to be more demand. We are going to expand, uh, extend the, the tool. Uh, it is uh, based just for solar hybrid mini grids for now. So hydro mini hydro technologies are not yet in, in included. Um, just another slide to have uh, an overview of some of the output. Once data has been collected, it's possible to see a load profile. This is an example of a load profile on a site in, in Kenya. So with this, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Pierre, for the presentation. Um, so now at this point, um, I'd like to go ahead and open up the question and answer session for the webinar. Um, so just a reminder to all our attendees out there, if you have any questions for our panelists today, please feel free to type those into the question pane and uh, we can present those to the speakers right now. Um, so with that, I'd like to get started with the first question that we did receive, uh, and this one was for Peter on the Homer uh, tool. They were wondering, uh, Peter, what the cost of the of using the tool is. Um, yes, yeah, so we have um, several different licensing, uh, and it depends on. We have uh, discounts for students and for academic researchers. We have monthly, annual, and permanent licenses. Uh, we have the base product. Uh, and then um, add-on modules, like for example, the advanced grid is an add-on module. So, um, the, um, probably the most common thing is for people to buy an, an annual license of the base product is $500, uh, but the and the monthly licenses would for that would be a, um, oh I, you know I don't know the exact number, but it's around it's around $100. Uh, the first 30 days or first month is is free. And um, students get something like a 75% discount. And Peter, just a quick follow-up: Is that available for on uh, the tools available on Macs as well? I would assume. I'm sorry. I, I, available on what was the last word? On, on both PCs and Macs, uh, Apple Macs. <laughs> uh, it runs very well under a, a Windows emulator. Uh, it doesn't run native on uh, Mac OS, but. Uh, Par parallels or VMware, uh, it, it runs well under those. Great, thank you, Peter. Uh, we have a question for Pierre that came in. Uh, Pierre had asked, what sort of financial factors does the model um, account for? Uh, what sort of financial factors? So um, the tool uh, does not look into into the operation of, of the mini grid. It's basically uh, basically just capex based. So it's going to see what is uh, the cost, uh, for instance, of uh, of solar panel or the cost of different technology within uh, within the country. Um, uh, the user can also, for instance, uh, update the, his internal rate of return. He can put uh, the target profits that uh, he's looking in, in terms of, of rates or the, the payback, which is uh, which is which is foreseen. And this is uh, on the on, on the third slide. And all, all these financial assumptions can be freely validated before uh, just clicking and asking the tool to do the calculation. So it's possible to do different simulation. Uh, uh, 
and have different scenarios based on one set of collected data. And Pierre, uh, another question directed towards you. Uh, it was asking, uh, you noted that the mini grid builder is good for, um, it, it works best in five countries in East Africa. Um, could you just explain a little bit why you focus on that and why it's not, um, is it effective elsewhere as well? Oh, yes, the, the reason is that uh, behind the tool there is a database uh, with uh, solar insulation and there is a database with exhaustive places. Uh, so we are using actually accurate data uh, in this database and it was just uh, lots of work for the consultant one show energy uh, who was hired to do this this work to actually put this database. Um, therefore that's why we have targeted one area, uh, East Africa for, for the moment, but we, we foresee that if there is a, a higher demand we can populate the database with uh, much more much more data. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, now we have a question for Basel on the catalog of mini-grid tools. Uh, Basel, they were wondering if you have any good practice projects uh, integrated into the catalog. Um, any, any best lessons learned or best case studies, anything like that? We haven't included such uh, until now. Uh, there has been discussion within the HIO to come up with some standard model for describing business uh, cases uh, for mini-grids uh, and once we have that standardized model I think we would uh, we could expand but we haven't included that so far. Thank you Basel. Uh, and now I have a couple general questions on the existence of other tools um, so we'll start with the first one that I have. Uh, so this is for all panelists. Uh, do you know of any monitor, monitoring systems that link to design tools such as Homer or others so that a feedback on the system performance is given and continued assessment of the system is ensured? So really a monitoring and assessment tool um, that would link to design tool. Does, is anyone aware of any mini-grid tools like that? Uh, this is Peter. We're, we're investigating that. Um, uh, that question um, comes up, um, well, it's coming up with more and more frequency. If we go back a couple of years, it didn't come up very often. There weren't that many operating systems out yet. Uh, so, um, so we're looking at that, uh, but right at the moment, I, I, I wouldn't say that we, we, we have that capability yet. Yeah. Yeah, it depends. So this is Pierre, GNZ uh, Kenya. Um, we have put in place some kind of Excel sheets that can be used for monitoring, but this is just like tra tracking the, the key performance indicators on, on a given project. Uh, if it's uh, about the remote monitoring, uh, right now we've heard of uh, the Strathmore University uh, they are developing a tool which is going to it's going to be based on on G GSM uh, technology uh, for remote monitoring. Uh, right now, what we know is uh, it's just monitoring basically the load, uh, which is uh, which is a good start uh, already. But I'm not sure if it's out yet. I think uh, last time I heard it was still under development. Great, thanks. You know, along those lines, I might mention a, a project that's sort of underway uh, at, with NREL and uh, um, Department of Energy on a quality assurance framework that includes an accountability framework. So they're defining the parameters that um, you'd want to measure or monitor in a in a um, mini grid. Uh, so. That's still in very much a draft form, but it, it's, it, we just had a call on it yesterday. It's, it's you know under active development, um, and uh, that would feed into what you're talking about. One of my frustrations up until recently, in the past, was how infrequently the systems were actually had monitoring that you could even collect data from. So they do pilot projects would get done with no monitoring, which sort of defeats the purpose of a pilot project. Uh, that seems to be changing rapidly, though, and, and there should be a lot more data now. So I think that was a really 
apropos and good question to raise. I, I can also add here, we, we've carried out a number of technical inspections of mini grids in Indonesia and this, uh, we have quite a lot of data. The guideline, the checklists that we've used that are available online, I'd be happy to, to share the links to that. Uh, on, on top of that, we are currently uh, in discussions with a number of uh, organizations and we're trying to collect more data on uh, load profiles and load development curves. Um, so those, uh, we, we haven't, we're in the process of developing a methodology and uh, a way to um, plug in the data and get the result pretty quickly. So, so that's something that we'll be working on in the next few months. Great, thank you guys for the input. Uh, we did have a couple attendees also comment as well. Um, one attendee noted that, uh, Peter noted, Peter Stevenson noted that uh, a lot of monitoring software often comes with component suppliers. So depending on who you buy your components from, sometimes they will supply those. Um, other examples um, include one attendee, uh, Silvario, is using eGage, uh, the eGage tool to monitor a project um, that was actually modeled in Homer. Um, and so there are uh, there are some out there, whether or not those can be fed directly into a tool like Homer, um, I'm not sure, but there are at least some, some tools out there for monitoring and assessing the performance of a mini grid. Um, so we'll move on to the next topic. Um, uh, Peter, this one's for you. Just a quick question again, kind of on, on cost for Homer. Uh, is the tool available for free for NGOs? Uh, no. Well, we do. We, we, if, um, we do try to uh, be very flexible for uh, the small um, uh, you know, NGOs in developing countries. So, you know, send us a note. Uh, I, I want to comment that you know NREL is an NGO. You know, I mean, the word, the concept of an NGO covers uh, a huge amount of terrain, including some very very large, well-funded organizations are still NGOs. So, uh, but we do we do we are very interested in maintaining uh, our user base in the developing world with country, uh, organizations that that may be very resource limited. So. Um, we don't want to uh, uh, be too too blanket on on that. Um, so, but we do have a, a support staff to support, et cetera. Great, <laughs> thank you, Peter. Um, next question asks: uh, Does Homer or GIZ or are you aware of any other organizations that would help? Uh, or assist in the developing of alternative tools, so to help uh, develop tools in maybe a specific area where a tool doesn't exist. You are aware of any resources that could assist with that process? Well, we'd love to have those resources ourselves. Uh, so, no, I'm sorry. We're... Yeah, that's, that's, that's what everyone's looking for, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, may, maybe the person who has asked the question may touch base with us and uh, we might be willing to explore much more as uh, GIZ what is uh, the scope of, uh, of this kind of tool and if, if it fits uh, some of our objectives for instance like reducing tariff, reducing cost, if this is something that can be useful for the mini grid community would like to, to explore. So if I can just encourage the person who asked the question to just get in touch with us. Yeah, and not only that, I think uh, just because we, we have these discussions uh, on a regular basis in the framework of the HIO, uh, it would be good to, to be aware of what kind of tools uh, are needed uh, so that we can also use the network of the HIO to, to map uh, and find much potential resources just because in the network, uh, the membership, uh, there are organizations that are looking at supporting certain knowledge pieces, including the development of tools. So that's something that uh, I think it would be great to, to share in the, in the HMO network. If the, the person that's question, uh, asked the question could get in touch with Tripta or myself and then we'll, we'll channel it to the rest of the group. Great, thanks guys. Um, this one's for all the speakers. 
Uh, are, is anyone aware of a toolkit for conducting a market assessment of mini grids on a national level? Sorry, a market assessment for mini grids on a national level. Yeah, uh, maybe I can just say a few words since um, mini grids are very much site specific. I think that they can be also very, very much country specific. Uh, so a tool that can just uh, see the whole market uh, as a whole might be something that needs to be frequently updated. Uh, but we know, for instance, uh, of the OBIN indicator from uh, the Solar Stiftung in, in Germany, which has uh, mapped uh, like the potential market for, for Africa. And it is a release which is done every year. And it's looking into, for instance, the existing of solar home system. Uh, it is a general indicator, but can give like a first idea in terms of uh, what is the real uh, potential market. It's an indicator. It's called OBIN. O B I N. There have been a number of studies done, um, uh, and uh, I, I, I don't sort of have that bibliography in front of me. We're in the middle of a, a study for the Inter-American Development Bank in Haiti. Um, and I and we've also been working with IRENA, not so much uh, uh, on a sort of somewhat related uh, um, project. But as, as um, uh, Pierre said, it's a real moving target. It absolutely would be a worthwhile endeavor. And our new database. We haven't figured out exactly how to use that, but it could um, really feed into to a, a, a market study like that. It, it's, it's just so it's so new for us. We haven't we haven't actually started to mine that data yet. But um, I, I think it's a, that's a really good question. Thanks, guys. And a couple of quicker questions for Pierre on the mini grid builder. Um, Pierre, can that tool be downloaded? And also, once downloaded, uh, can it be used offline, or is it purely web-based? Uh, right now, the version that we have is uh, is web-based, and it can be accessed from any normal uh, web browser. Uh, but it's a good question. Uh, we we are thinking if that may be an alternative to have it also downloadable and uh, have probably maybe an app or, or, or something that can be worked also uh, totally offline because uh, one of the challenges uh, is that uh, uh, the places where data are being collected sometimes are, are offline. So it, it's it's a valid concern. But what we have right now is purely web-based. Thank you, Pierre. Um, here's kind of a, a, a more general question. Uh, what can be done for private companies in West Africa or other developing countries to help them master the project development phase in mini grids using tools? So I think more generally, what, what can be done to help those private companies access and use these tools to develop mini grids? Any insights on that? Maybe I, was, uh, uh, I can jump in. Um, it's like initiatives like this one. Um, just uh, first of all, making sure that people are aware of uh, the tools that are existing out there. Uh, it works like uh, what Ozil is doing, compiling already all, all of those tools. And uh, with uh, this kind of webinars, just, uh, just, just sharing. Uh, I think that will be a, a good starting point. Great. Thanks, Pierre. So outreach and uh, just making them aware of the tools um, definitely help a lot. Uh, Pierre, we had another question for you uh, regarding your tool. Is it possible to include, <clears throat> excuse me, is it possible to include project financing metrics like loan terms, equity percentage, or grant percentage of total project cost? Yes, the, the tool already has that. Uh, 
it has uh, a percentage of uh, the financing which comes from loan, uh, the financing which comes from, from equity. So in the validation of financial, uh, the financial assumption, uh, the, the developer or the user of the tool actually can just uh, uh, adapt that to, to the specific need. And he can even put his uh, own uh, country specific internal, uh, the, the interest rate, for instance, for, for the loan. And Pierre, what's the, what's the cost to use that tool? Um, the tool is free uh, for now, so all, all you need to do is just to go to minigridbuilder.com and just create, a, create an account, so, so it, it's free. Uh, it, it has been financed uh, by, by public money. Uh, the, the difference, for instance, with, uh, with Comer uh, is, is that um, um, the initiatives of, of GIZ are looking into, into supporting uh, uh, mini-grids. Of course, we also look into the sustainability of, of such tools, but for right now it is, it is purely on a, on a free bed and uh, it's not uh, like uh, money generating tool. A quick question for you, Pierre. I think you already touched on this, but can the uh, mini grid builder tool be used in Nigeria? Um, I would say yes. Um, the, the only thing is that um, the the solar insulation data, which are into the database, are not the specific ones of, of Nigeria. Uh, but with some approximation, uh, if somebody will select a country uh, at the equator which has like a similar ins insulation characteristics, uh, it, it can be used. Perfect, thank you. And uh, this one now moving on to uh, Peter, uh, another question about Homer, a uh, couple questions about Homer. What is the best geographical scale to apply to Homer? Scale. Um, we use it for quite a wide range of scales, really. Um, and um, uh, I usually think of scale in terms of the size of the load, actually, not um, the geographic extent of the mini grid. Um, so, so I'm not probably answering the exact same the exact question that was asked, but um, we've used it for systems as small as a, a single kilowatt. You know, it's probably kind of overkill when you get down any, you know, below that. Um, and we've also modeled 100 megawatt systems or even 250 megawatt systems. I would say a sweet spot is kind of in the middle of that range, you know, sort of 50 kilowatts to 5 megawatts is sort of, I would say, the su sweet spot. Uh, that's in terms of load. In terms of scale, the, it doesn't actually mo model the poles and wires and tra transformers and it just, meets, you know, it, it models what's the supply and demand balance to meet the load, um, but it's an entirely different modeling problem of modeling voltage drops and reactive power flows and, and the, the distribution uh, planning aspect of it. And that's where the geography would come into play. So it's really not a geographic or a, a distribution planning tool. It's, a, it's really more about the power supply. And, and the balance between supply and demand. Hope I answered. I, I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I think so. I think that makes sense, definitely. Um, uh, just an, another question on Homer, a couple questions on Homer. Um, do you offer, are the trainings that you offer for Homer remote online so that people can um, take them from, from wherever they're located? And what is, it obviously depends on each individual, but approximately, what would be your guess on how long it would take to learn the basics of the Homer tool? Right. So we the training comes in a variety of ways. We do we do in person trainings, um, and, but we also have some regular online trainings as well. And as I mentioned, we're expanding our training program, so that's all going to expand quite a bit um, over the next couple of months. Uh, so yes, we have online trainings typically twice a month, and we try to change the time, um, you know, to vary the time that they're, of day that they're offered so that, uh, uh, you know, times that are good for Africa aren't really that good for Southeast Asia, et cetera. 
Um, uh, so that's all on our website. Uh, if you find the training page on our website, it will give the um, times and days of the next online training. Um, and in terms of how long it takes to get proficient, really does depend on the individual. Uh, the intro training is uh, is typically three hours, two, uh, two to three hours, uh, and that gets you started. It gets you familiar with the interface. Uh, we also have a tour built into it and quite a bit of help, uh, so you can do that on your own as well. Uh, and I, I would say that you know, in, in three hours you can get you can get started. You can get so that you're doing doing stuff. There's a lot of capability that's not necessarily really visible. Um, uh, and so it, you know, um, the, so when we think about the new training programs we're creating, they're going to be in multiple levels, and we'll have a basic level and a variety of advanced levels. So it doesn't take a lot to get started, um, but to get really good at it, um, it, it would take um, some dedicated effort, depending upon what your background with renewable power computer modeling, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm not, it's difficult for me to answer the question, what would it take to get really good at it? But to get started is not, is a, is a couple of hours. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, uh, another question came in for Basel. Um, Basel's, uh, one of our attendees just wants to thank you for the, uh, the list of tools in the presentation and wonders, are the, any of the tools evaluated ready for more complex grid connected systems? So do any of them go beyond the typical mini grid and start to deal with grid connected systems? Oh, you there, Basel? Capabilities, ability, so no, that would be some to start with, and then if there are questions, we can easily answer. Sorry, Basil, I think you were muted at first. Could you just uh, repeat your your response, please? Yes, I, I sorry for that. Uh, I think it would be great to just review the list and uh, where in the descriptions of the tools, some of them provide already the relevance for grid or off-grid systems. Great, thank you, Basil. Uh, and a couple more questions for Pierre. <clears throat> and just a reminder, uh, or just to let everyone know, we are starting to run a little low on time, but we have quite a few questions left, so we'll just keep the responses as, as brief as we can so we can hopefully address as many of these as possible. Um, so this one's for Pierre. <clears throat> Are lower efficiency of diesel generators in batteries with time reflected in the tool? And what lifetime is typically used for solar diesel hybrids? So a pretty specific set of questions there. So um, I didn't understand the question. Well, what time is specifically used? Yeah, they're wondering uh, what, the time. what lifetime for the solar, so lifetime of the systems is taken into account. Oh yes, okay. Um, well, um, the lifetime for, for instance, it depends on, on the components. Uh, on the solar components, uh, we have uh, different lifetime. For instance, for for the solar panels, we have different lifetime lifetimes for for inverters. Uh, different lifetimes for batteries, and it depends very much on the on the design and on the manufacturer. For instance, if we go on to tubular batteries, we can expect a lifetime of 12 years. If we go into inverters like SMA type, we can go something above seven years, up to 10 years sometimes. Uh, if we are looking into the solar panels, most, most manufacturers are guaranteeing the output for 25 years. Uh, so uh, it depends very much uh, on each one of, of the components. So the whole system uh, as a whole cannot, uh, we, it's very difficult to say this is the lifetime of, of the whole system. And therefore the model, uh, I see where the question comes, um, the, the model uh, behind the, the tool uh, is taking uh, uh, like standard lifetime for each one of the main components uh, to actually come into uh, a break-even conclusion. 
Thanks, Pierre. And <clears throat> are there plans to develop the tool further? Yes, we we are looking into um, having a kind of uh, of partnership for the reason I have mentioned before, uh, for sustainability reasons. Uh, the nature of uh, GIZ work is that we support projects for a certain period of time, and when, uh, for instance, our activities are, are done, the projects are completed, then uh, we may move into into something else. Well, a tool like this uh, probably needs to be in the market for for a longer a longer time. So right now, um, it's it's out there for for free. Uh, but of course, behind there is a cost for for running the the server, for hosting the tool. Uh, there might be some maintenance needed. Um, plans for maybe making it uh, downloadable device. We are looking into actually also making an app, also because everybody is now using apps and tablets, uh, which might make things easier. Uh, so we are exploring some of those options, mainly the main idea is sustainability so at the end of our our project uh, the tool has to still remain in the market and accessible to project developers great thanks Pierre um, we have time for one more quick question um, this is one that I um, get quite a bit so I'd like to ask this one um, but please try to keep the responses uh, uh, brief as possible as we're running really close on uh, uh, on time. Is there any software available to determine uh, for rural electrification planning in case uh, to determine the least cost analysis between on and off grid systems? So whether or not they should pursue an off grid mini grid or extend uh, the central grid? Well, in, in Homer, we do have a, a, a simple um, calculator for what we call break-even grid extension distance. So we can compare the cost of the off-grid, uh, microgrid, hybrid system to the cost of grid extension and, and see like where that, where the break-even point is. Um, uh, that's, that, it's a pretty simple analysis, but we do that in Homer. I, and I want to reinforce Pierre's point about replacement costs and of the cost of a system. You're not going to just replace the system, you're going to replace individual components within the system, and a lot of times people don't uh, keep track of that adequately, don't set aside money for repla replacing, particularly the battery and the, and the diesel generators, and it depends uh, uh, strongly on how they're used. So, so that was a really important question, but I'll, uh, I just wanted to throw that in. I can also add, Brazil here, uh, there are a number of tools that have been used. There are several commercial solutions for rectification planning that include both grid extensions and off-grid off systems. I would be conscious to recommend any because uh, they all need some up updating when it comes to the actual analysis because the costs of all the different technologies develop over time and a tool that has been developed five years ago may need to be adapted to the, the current situation. So we've listed a few of those tools in, uh, in the draft uh, catalog uh, that you can find in the, uh, on the link. And there have been uh, tools or, or models that have been uh, developed in the past that are not available um, online for downloads. Uh, there are publications available uh, based on the usage of these tools. And there are some that certain organizations have been using internally to provide such uh, services on, as a consultancy. Um, if there are specific questions, I'd be happy to uh, pick them up and uh, respond if I can, or direct the, um, the person who's asked the question to the companies or organizations and individuals who have developed particular tools. We've yeah. uh, reviewed a number of these tools uh, in our work and I've used several in different countries, so we have a pretty good overview. Yeah, maybe if I, this is Pierre, if I can just add something very quickly, is that uh, the mini-grid builder gives uh, at the end of the report the cost of implementing a mini-grid after that has been collected. So if uh, the person is, for instance, looking what is the least cost, 
on one hand they will have the cost of the mini grid and if one can just know what is maybe the average cost in the country for grid extension at the end it's just comparing now to cost so the mini grid builder already provides the cost at least for mini grid Great, thank you guys. Um, we do have to move on now and wrap up the webinar uh, as we're just about out of time. Uh, before we do that, I uh, kindly ask that our attendees participate in a quick survey that we have. Um, so I will display the first question on the screen and you can respond right through that portal. Um, the statement is the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight. And the second question, the webinar's presenters were effective. And the third one, overall the webinar met my expectations. Great, and just uh, two more. Do you anticipate using the information presented in this webinar directly in your work and or organization? And then the final one. Do you anticipate applying the information presented to develop or revise policies or programs in your country of focus? Great. Thank you so much for the feedback uh, through the survey. We appreciate your responses. And on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I would just like to thank our expert panelists once again and also our attendees. Uh, we appreciate everyone's time and are, are happy that you joined us today. Um, I do invite the attendees to, to check the Solutions Center webpage, um, the, specifically the training page. We'll be posting the PDF copies of the presentations uh, an audio recording of the webinar, and we're also um, going to be posting that catalog of tools um, that Basel uh, displayed. Um, so that will be up there as well. Uh, additionally, you'll find information on other upcoming webinars and other training events. And just a reminder, we're now posting uh, webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Uh, we have a variety of other rural electrification, mini grid, and energy access webinars up there as well. Um, also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solution Center resources and services, including the no-cost Ask an Expert policy support. So with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solution Center events. And this concludes our webinar.